let's go down the, the Trump case rabbit hole, if you will. You brought up the ballot case. It's pretty obvious the Supreme Court's going to address this. The question I have, based on your expertise, there's always a question about, does the Supreme Court take a very narrow view, kind of go in surgically and address a very narrow way where they, they don't get deep into the issue? And so they yeah. just say, yeah, he can be on the ballot. Or do they actually address the issue of of whether he engaged in insurrection or not? I think they do it based on uh, Chapter 5 of the 14th Amendment that gives Congress the power to set procedures for who can be disqualified. You can't have a single secretary of state, a radical leftist, decide that he can't serve on this ballot, but somebody from the right decides, yes, he can serve, he can run on that ballot. It has to be a national uh, issue with national standards. And I think the Supreme Court will take a narrow view, but I'm hoping they go nine nothing on this. Uh, but, you know, who knows? It could be 6-3. You know, the most recent case involving the Texas Bob Wire was 5-4 to four with two uh, conservatives joining uh, the three liberals. So, you know, you never know what the vote is going to be. So there's a deadline. I mean, the, these these ballots, this, these cases, Maine and others are in March. When does the court, ha- from a schedule standpoint, is this something that they are going to have to, I, I mean, I get that we want an answer sooner rather than later, but where are we in the court schedule in terms of how this plays out? Well, first of all, there's stays. So right now he goes on the ballots, but uh, the case is going to be argued very soon. And I, I suspect the Supreme Court will come down, at least with a preliminary decision, very quickly and allow him to be on the ballots. And then maybe there'll be a longer term decision uh, over time. But my prediction is he will be on every ballot of every state. The thing that I found so ironic about Maine and Colorado in particular was they're trying to get a kick off the primary ballot. And, and there's always been there's a second piece of law which allows the parties to govern their nominees and their processes for for choosing their nominees. And I thought yeah. this is odd that a bunch of Democrats are interfering in a party process about checking the nominees. They weren't trying to get them off the general election yet. They were focused on screwing with the party process, which I thought was unique and interesting. Right. And especially since the party has the right to abolish the primary and just go to caucuses Correct. or just have the head of the who the nominee is going to be. There's nothing in the Constitution about how parties determine who the candidates will be. And back in the day when, you know, Jefferson and Barr and all those guys, uh, they weren't primaries. So let's we, we've got the 14th Amendment piece down. I want to switch over from criminal to civil for a second. Uh, this E. Jean Carroll decision that came down. What fascinated me yeah. about this whole thing was you we felt like from an America standpoint, from a viewer standpoint, we jumped in from like he had already been found guilty of uh, sexual harassment or sexual inappropriate. I, I don't even know the charges. And we were now suddenly thrust into the uh, to the financial aspect of it. What what damages were going to be awarded to him? I, to me, I, I, I can't believe I mean, eighty three million dollars uh, for defaming her, et cetera, seems like an excessive amount. This goes back to what we were talking about before in terms of the Peter Navarro uh, decision and penalty. Did, did the, is the number what jumps out and says this is ridiculous? Oh, yeah. And her lawyers, she are doing a very stupid thing. She's now on television becoming a public figure and benefiting tremendously from this case. She's going on television. She's send, telling all these people how she's going to spend the money. She's going to become famous. She's going to do this and do that. Court of Appeals looking at this is going to say $80 million? Maybe $80 comes closer to the actual damage she suffered from the defamation. It looks like she's benefited from the defamation. As far as the sexual assault is concerned, of course, that's different. Remember she was that he was found not liable for rape. It was a strange verdict. They didn't believe her on the issue of her rape. They didn't believe her. This was just by the preponderance of the evidence. They didn't believe her, but they believed her in sexual assault. Now, you know, I've been teaching criminal law 60 years. I have a hard time distinguishing between rape and sexual assault, but the jury, that's how they found it. This verdict will be lowered. And if it's not, it will be another example of that job. Who, so if he didn't do well with that New York jury, is it when he goes to the Court of Appeals, is it justices or is that another jury trial as well? No, it's uh, the judges. 
and they look at the relationship between actual damages and punitive damages. And in almost all these cases, uh, they reduce the sentence. For example, if Trump's lawyers is not going to do this, but if Trump's lawyers were to go to them now and say, hey, I'll tell you what, don't appeal, we'll pay you $25 million, they would accept that in 10 seconds, of course, because they know this, it's going to be reduced. They don't know by how much, but they know it's going to be reduced. So the thing that I found fascinating was in, in the aftermath of this, his lawyer was talking about all the things that couldn't have been introduced. Was that because, like, for example, there was a CNN tape uh, where she talks about rape uh, with uh, Anderson Cooper, and there were all these other aspects of stuff. And the the lawyer for Trump kept saying, I wasn't allowed to introduce it. Is that because this was purely a defamation and a damages aspect of the case? Or was that at all? No, it was because it was damages. But I still think a lot of it should have been able to be introduced on the issue of how, how much was she really hurt. And uh, I don't think the uh, jury heard all the evidence about her actual harm that she suffered. And also on the punitive damages, it should have been allowed in. And I think the Court of Appeals will look hard at some of these issues. But I guarantee you it will be reversed. And if it's not reversed, it will be because it's part of the get Trump. If it's not reversed, is that the end of the road or can he keep going higher judicially? He can go to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court is unlikely to take the right. case in State uh, uh, involving even federal court damages is a federal court, but it's based on state law. It just seems to me that even for a rich guy, $83 million is a hard liquid amount to to get, right? They keep talking about him potentially having to sell stuff. I mean, th this seems like it's literally meant to cripple him. Well, it's really meant to hurt him very badly. And, and I think, you know, remember, this is New York and uh, everything in New York is going to go against them even though the weakest criminal case that there is is the New York case brought by District Attorney Bragg, a New York jury is going to rule in, in, against Trump. They would not only indict, they would convict a ham sandwich if it had the name Trump on it. Again, get Trump. That's Remember, the DA and the, and the state attorney general both ran on the platform of, we're going to get Trump. When you run on that platform and you know you're going to lose re-election unless you get Trump, that's not a fair application of prosecutorial discretion. So you brought up the, the, the other, I mean, you've got this other case about his business practices. And I keep reading that there's literally no precedent for a, a decision, especially of this magnitude, a ruling against him when there's no victim, right? The banks are saying, hey, we got our money back. We were fine with that. We, we, we knew the terms of the deal. There's no victim in the case. And yet the attorney general, Tish James, goes after Trump years after all this takes place. Uh, this is another one. Again, we it's it's like it just keeps coming where on its face, you have to look at that and say, if it wasn't Donald Trump, would there be any way that this would be prosecuted? I don't know of any case and I've done so many of these cases over my 60 years, any case where an attorney general decided to protect banks when the banks didn't want to be protected and use resources that could be used to protect people, ordinary people from being defrauded. Here you have a bank that has the ability to check on the worth of buildings. Everybody knows that people overstate the value of their buildings when they're getting a loan. Uh, this was an absurd case to bring. Yeah. So, so does that follow the same sequence as the other civil one, which is uh, hey, he'll appeal that and then hopefully either get it reduced or wh where does that, does that follow the same sort of judicial sequence? Yes, it's the same, it's the same thing, but we'll see where the courts of appeals, remember, state courts of appeals are elected. And so, you know, when you live in anti-Trump neighborhoods like New York, you don't want to go against the voters. But, uh, this is also being appealed, the other case in the federal court, the Court of Appeals Second Circuit. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I don't think these verdicts will be allowed to stand as they are.